end of the session. And um, I'll moderate them. If there are any questions that we don't have time to answer within the session today, we'll be liaising with Emily and the Commission for Children and Young People um, and endeavour to have your questions answered. Um, the, because <laughs> we do have quite a short um, amount of time for questions and um, we want to get through as much time with Emily speaking as possible. Uh, for today's best view, if you want to pop yourself on speaker view, you'll be able to see myself and Emily as we moderate um, the questions um, and you'll be able to see Emily's PowerPoint shortly. So um, without further ado, I would like to okay. welcome Emily. Um, and Emily is the Director mm -hmm. of Regulation at the Commission for Children and Young People. And I'll put it in time. Looking yeah. after yeah. administration, um, uh, looking after administration of the Reportable Conduct Scheme and Child Safe Standards. She's a background in law and has previous experience working at regulators, including the EPA uh, and the Victorian Commission for Gambling and Liquor Regulation. She also has policy experience in law enforcement and youth justice. So welcome, Emily, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks everybody uh, for attending today. Uh, it's lovely to see the num numbers building uh, as people uh, log on after their lunch. Um, uh, so look, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many different lands across Victoria that you'll be joining this meeting from uh, today. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging uh, and extend a particular welcome to any Aboriginal colleagues who are in the room with us today. So bear with me whilst I now uh, share my PowerPoint presentation. Just double checking, Sarah, is that up? That is up. Thank you. Perfect. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so look, I'd just like to acknowledge um, uh, Georgette from the Commission who's also here today. So she's helped um, prepare this. So she's from our team uh, that is leading the implementation of the new Child Safe Standards. So uh, you're welcome to, to fire any questions her way uh, as well as we go and, and we'll do our best to, to get through as much as we can. So I'll give you a bit of a presentation today, about um, 45 minutes or so. Uh, we'll leave some time for your questions at the end. Uh, uh, so please um, don't hesitate to, to sort of send them through either as you go, as you got them, um, and uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye out and try and grab them at the end. Uh, if we don't get time to get through everything, that's okay. Uh, we're happy to take questions on notice and we can get back to you later on. Uh, the other thing I'll just ask is bear with us. Uh, uh, this is, I think, maybe the second or third time, Georgette, that we've given a presentation on the new child safe standards. So uh, we're still refining timing. So if I get halfway through this and go, oh, goodness me, uh, I need to speed up a bit and I'm going to skip some of these slides, uh, I hope you'll understand. All right. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, I'll give you obviously a bit of an overview of the new child safe standards themselves. I'll talk a little bit about how we at the Commission are going to approach our regulatory role with the standards. Um, uh, we will do a, whis a whistle stop tour of the 11 standards and I say it will be whistle stop um, but there's plenty more guidance out there for you to delve into after this session. Uh, we'll talk to you about um, uh, the minimum requirements and that's a, a new feature to the child safe standards. Um, we'll talk to you about what that means and what that means that you need to do in your organisations. Uh, we'll also talk to you about this concept of compliance indicators, which is a new, uh, a new thing that the Commission's done to try and give organisations a better understanding of what they need to do to comply. We'll connect you with what are the different resources and guidance material uh, that we've produced by the Commission. Uh, and we're going to do all of that in 45 minutes. So let's go. Um, I just want to acknowledge, I guess, that we are talking about um, subject matter that can be um, challenging for some people. So, so our presentation today uh, necessarily needs to deal with, uh, with child abuse and the prevention and response uh, uh, to child abuse um, incidents. So um, some of us uh, are in very different places about that. If you uh, feel that you need to take some time out of today's presentation to keep yourself safe, uh, that is absolutely fine by us. We won't take offence. So please do what you need to do to to keep yourself safe today. So in recent years, uh, we've had the benefit of learning uh, a lot more about um, child abuse in institutions from the many uh, brave survivors 
of abuse um, uh, who, who chose to, to participate in the multiple inquiries that, are, that have happened in this area. So this includes Victoria's Betrayal of Trust Inquiry uh, and then the Federal Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. These have shown us the devastating extent uh, of harm done to children when organisations do not have the right cultures, systems, processes and understanding to prevent uh, abuse. So your organisation needs to take deliberate steps to safeguard children from physical, sexual, emotional and psychological abuse and neglect. Uh, your organisation needs to put children's safety and wellbeing first um, and embed that commitment to child safety in every aspect of your organisation. And the child safe standards are a regulatory framework which requires you to do that. Uh, we've had mandatory child safe standards in Victoria since 2016. Uh, uh, and, and after the, the Royal Commission federally, the Victorian government decided to review those standards um, and the review identified uh, very strong support for re retaining the, the child safe standards, but it also recommended a number of changes. Um, uh, one of the changes is to better align the standards with the national principles for child safe organisations, which some of you might be aware of. There were some other recommendations made uh, to strengthen the administration of the standards as well. So in line with these recommendations, the new child safe standards were released by the Victorian government in 2021. Uh, there's 11 updated standards which replace the current seven standards and three principles, and they will apply from 1 July 2022. So in implementing the new child safe standards, uh, you've got the opportunity to reflect on all the efforts that you've put in place uh, since the standards were first introduced uh, and take those steps to now further build your own capacity and your own systems to, to keep children safe. Mm. So these are the 11 standards that we now have on screen. Uh, uh, in some areas, we know that organisations are going to need to develop some new child safe practices. So there are a couple of changes in there and I'll talk to those briefly. Uh, but you can also see that many aspects of the new standards are very familiar um, and, and there'll be a lot that your organisation has already done that's going to meet the, the new standards. Uh, so with this song, strong foundation that you'll already have as an organisation, uh, uh, you know, it, it's about taking the time now to really reflect um, and think about what you're going to need to do uh, to implement the new standards. So as you're going through this, I think any new things that you're hearing from me, note those down, go back into our guidance material and start to make an action plan um, so that you can uh, take the action that you need to in your organisation. Um, the other point I just want to make here is that there's no change uh, in the new standards to who has to comply. So the same group of organisations still need to comply with the child safe standards. No new ones have been added. Uh, there, there's nobody who's been taken out of the need to comply. If you're still a bit unsure about whether your organisation needs to comply with the child safe standards, we've got some really um, straightforward information up on our website that you can check. Um, and after you've had a look at that information, if you still remain a bit unsure, you're welcome to make contact with the Commission and we can have a look at your individual circumstances with you and, and just give you that guidance. So let's start to talk now about what the key differences are with the new child safe standards. Um, so there's a couple of really important features that I want to talk through uh, with the new standards. Uh, one key difference is that we now have a dedicated standard focusing on cultural safety for Aboriginal children and young people in organisations. Uh, and there's also a, a, a strong focus in there on empowerment and participation of children and young people. And that focus obviously is part of the old standards, but it's something that's, that's certainly being retained and strengthened in, in these new child safe standards. There's also several new requirements brought in by standards 4, 9, 10 and 11. Uh, so organisations must involve families and communities in their efforts to keep children and young people safe. Uh, they need to make sure they're managing the risk of child abuse in online environments. Now that obligation's already been there, but now it's really quite explicit and you've got some quite um, specific things that you need to take care of there. So focusing on online environments as well as physical environments for the organisation. You also need to regularly review your implementation of the child safe standards. Again, that's been a feature of how the, the Commission's been speaking about the child safe standards for some time now, but there's a much more prescriptive set of obligations you've got in relation to that. 
there's also specific requirements now to document your child safe approach in policies mm. and procedures. So as I said before, there's, there's a lot here that we at the Commission have already been asking for from organisations. The new standards make this stuff quite specific, quite clear, quite prescriptive. So organisations have a lot greater clarity now about what they need to do. If you're interested in trying to track that change a bit further between the old and the new standards, we've got a dedicated information sheet up on our website that actually talks to that specifically. So that can be a really good place um, for you to start as well if you think that you've got um, some pretty good systems already in place in your organisation. It'll just help you focus in a bit more on where to head. So talking now to, uh, I guess, how will the Commission approach it? And part of what we're doing today is how we're approaching it, which is we really want to help uh, connect organisations with uh, what they uh, need to do to comply, but also what the resources and what the support is that's out there. Um, uh, from the 1st of July 2022, uh, the new standards will apply, they will be law, the old standards will no longer be assessed by the Commission for Children and Young People. Uh, we recognise that organisations uh, will need to make some changes. Uh, some organisations will have a substantial amount of work ahead of them. Uh, others may not have a significant amount. It really depends upon the nature of your existing child safeguarding systems as to, to how, how big a task that is for you. We know that for some organisations, uh, it might also take a bit of time and effort to, to get things right. They might need to try a few things, work out the right, right way of implementing it for their organisation. So some organisations may not have fully implemented things by the 1st of July 2022, and we understand that. We will apply a, a policy that we have at the Commission called our regulatory approach um, uh, when approaching our task as a regulator. Uh, and a copy of this is available on our website. Probably the key things I wanted to, to let you know here is that uh, from the 1st of July 2022, we'll initially be focusing on informing and educating organisations about their obligations to comply. We, we want to help you to, to understand what you need to do and help you to get there. Uh, so we'll pro prioritise providing guidance and support to organisations if we find out that you're yet to fully uh, comply with the new standards. There might be some circumstances where we need to take uh, other sorts of action uh, uh, if we need to on the basis of uh, perhaps a serious safety risk to children and young people. Mm. From January 2023, uh, mm. the Commission will expect organisations to have more comprehensively implemented the child safe standards. Uh, January 2023 is when uh, some new legislation commences around the child safe standards uh, called the Child Wellbeing and Safety Child Safe Standards Compliance and Enforcement Amendment Act. Uh, that legislation, amongst other changes, provides the Commission uh, with more powers to monitor and enforce compliance with the new standards. We'll provide you with more information uh, as it gets closer to that legislation commencing so that you can understand what those changes are. We also know that uh, compliance with the child safe standards is not a set and forget exercise. Uh, you need to constantly review, don't you? How did that go this year? Did that work? What do we need to change? So that we're really achieving the outcomes that the standards set for organisations in respect of children and young people. Uh, this is now explicit in new standard 10, which talks about that review process and what needs to be implemented. Um, so in the same way, uh, we at the Commission will work with organisations to continually build an understanding of what compliance with the new standards looks like. Uh, we've, we've had a go at that in our new guidance material. We've tried to, to give you an understanding of what that picture looks like, but we will learn too as a regulator as we work with you once the new standards commence. So I'm now going to go through um, uh, an overview, I guess, of the main themes uh, with respect to each of the standards. Um, uh, I want to stress this is this is going to be quick. Um, uh, there's a lot of guidance material out there for you to delve into to get into this more deeply, but I want to allow a bit of time for some for some questions at the end. So. The new Child Safe Standard 1 requires organisations to take steps to create a culturally safe environment for Aboriginal children and young people. Uh, cultural safety for Aboriginal children has been defined as the child being provided with a safe, nurturing and positive environment where they are comfortable being themselves, uh, expressing their culture, their spiritual and belief systems, and they are supported by the carer who respects their Aboriginality and therefore encourages their sense of identity. 
achieving cultural safety involves understanding how an organisation is viewed and experienced by Aboriginal people, and particularly Aboriginal children. Organisations must meet the requirements under this standard, regardless of whether or not they know that there are Aboriginal children and young people currently in their organisation. It's likely that many organisations will need to take some additional steps to comply with the new standard one. Uh, implementing this standard also requires ongoing effort. It's not just about a once off change. So I'll take you through the Commission's approach to compliance with standard one a little later on in the presentation because it is slightly different. The Commission's also currently preparing uh, more detailed guidance on Standard 1 um, that we aim to release over the next few months. So we've given you plenty of guidance already in, in, uh, in our material that's been recently released, but I just want to stress is there's, there's even more coming to support organisations in this regard. A really good way to start with this standard is to consider how strong you think your organisation's current approach is to tackling racism and how inclusive you think your organisation is of Aboriginal children, young people and their families. The new Child Safe Standard 2 highlights the role of organisational leadership and governance arrangements in creating a safe environment for children and young people. Uh, it's about demonstrating accountability and ensuring that a child safe culture is developed and maintained. Uh, some of this stuff is going to be very familiar for those of you who are, are not new to the standards. Your organisation will need to make a public commitment to child safety. And this signals to the whole community that your uh, organisation prioritises the safety of children and will not tolerate child abuse or harm. A child safe culture means an organisation has shared attitudes, values, policies and practices that prioritise the safety and wellbeing of children. Having a child safe culture requires your organisation to build, culture, uh, build child safety into the everyday thinking and actions of leaders, staff, volunteers, members and children in the organisation. So your organisation must have a code of conduct that lists acceptable and unacceptable behaviours with children. You should have a child safety and wellbeing policy that outlines how your organisation prioritises the safety and wellbeing of children and what steps it will take to do this. New Child Safe Standard 3 asks organisations to empower children and young people uh, about their rights and enable them to participate in decisions affecting them. Children and young people need to be informed about their rights, including to safety, information and participation. Children are more likely to raise concerns or complaints in an organisation that empowers and listens to them. Policies and practices that are shaped by children's views can also better prevent harm to children. So empowering children about their rights means all people in an organisation, including leaders, staff and volunteers, uphold and respect children's rights at all times. They take a proactive role in educating them about their rights and support them to exercise those rights. Uh, children have a right to participate in the decisions that affect them. Uh, participation is about giving children opportunities to have their say and inform about and, and inform decision making in the organisation. This requires organisations to listen, hear and make appropriate changes based on what children say. Organisations will also need to recognise the importance of friendships uh, for children and young people and be encouraging uh, to support uh, there's support that peers uh, can offer uh, children and young people. And so what we're trying to do here is connect them with that level of support. This can help children and young people feel safe and be less isolated. New Child Safe Standard 4 outlines the ways in which an organisation can involve families and communities in its approach to child safety and wellbeing. Uh, this is one of the ones that I flagged that's got some new content that it's worth um, uh, having a bit of a read of. We know from the Royal Commission that transparency in organisations uh, involving families and communities is an important protective factor for children and young people. Empowering families and communities to play a part in your, in your organisation's child safety and wellbeing journey is beneficial for children. It means that parents, carers in the community will learn what helps make organisations child safe and how they can help keep children safe. Organisations can better support individual children with the benefit of insights from their families who know their children best. 
parents, carers and community will feel empowered and know what to do if they are worried about safety and wellbeing of children. Uh, and your organisation's child safe approach will continue to improve because of this involvement of parents and communities. It's important to note that families may be made up of a wide variety of relationships, including those who are related by blood, marriage, adoption, kinship structures, or other extended family structures. Communities, uh, we say, are a group of people who share common interests, experiences, social backgrounds, nationality, culture, beliefs, or identity. Uh, it, needless to say, families and communities are a very diverse concept. The new standard five recognises, uh, sorry, the new standard five means that organisations recognise and respect diversity and understand that some children are more vulnerable to abuse than others. Uh, it has uh, policies and practices uh, that ensure children have access to the relationships, skills, knowledge and resources they need to be safe. And, and what we're looking at here is that children are as safe as their peers. That's one way to think about what this standard is all about. Organisations need to pay particular attention to the needs of children and young people with disability, uh, children and young people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, those who are unable to live at home, uh, as well as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex children and young people. They also need to think about the needs of gender diverse uh, and non-binary children and young people as well. Particular attention needs to be paid as well to the needs of Aboriginal children and young people. Uh, and there's an obligation there to provide a culturally safe environment for them, as we spoke to a little bit earlier. All children and young people must be able to access uh, information, support and complaints processes in ways that are culturally safe, accessible and easy to understand. So if you think about what we were saying before around um, the different sorts of ways in which uh, children are made vulnerable by the different characteristics, what we're saying is you need to make sure your implementation of the child safe standards, make sure that all of those diverse children and young people uh, can access things like complaints processes, if you think about it in that way. New Child Safe Standard 6 describes recruitment practices and ongoing support for, child, for staff and volunteers that are the foundation of any child safe organisation. This again will be another standard where uh, some of this content will be quite familiar for you. So this includes appropriate screening, induction, training and regular supervision of staff and volunteers to ensure that uh, they are aware of the role they play in keeping children and young people safe. Uh, and you're doing your bit to make sure that the people in your organisation have been properly vetted to ensure they're appropriate to engage with children and young people. So you need to have good recruitment uh, practices. You need to have robust screening processes. Uh, Staff and volunteers also need uh, an appropriate induction when they, when they enter your organisation so that they understand their responsibilities to children and young people and also how to create a child safe environment for them. Supervision of staff and volunteers uh, and also your people management practices must be focused on child safety uh, and wellbeing. Child Safe Standard 7 uh, emphasises the importance of complaints processes uh, and that they need to be child focused and easily understood by children, young people and also families as well as staff and volunteers. So this is uh, quite a lot more detail now on what you need to consider in your uh, complaints processes from what you've seen under the, under the previous version of the standards. Uh, a child focused complaint handling process requires organisations to have a positive complaints culture. This means your organisation encourages and welcomes the reporting of concerns, responds to complaints promptly, thoroughly and fairly, and takes immediate action to protect children at risk. New Child Safe Standard 8 relates to the ongoing education and training for staff and volunteers as a way to build their knowledge and skills and ensure that they have a contemporary understanding of child development, safety and wellbeing. Staff and volunteers should be able to confidently identify and respond to indicators of abuse or neglect where children and young people disclose uh, uh, abuse or if they show signs that they are experiencing harm. 
when an organisation staff and volunteers are properly informed, trained and supported, they are more likely to uphold the organisation's child safe values and also more likely to report concerns to their manager or their child safety officer or other relevant person in the organisation. What's really important here, I think, is that there's now prescriptive requirements for the training uh, and support that you need to give your staff and volunteers in organisations. Uh, before, um, uh, I guess, uh, the standards were a lot more high level, um, but in terms of supporting volunteers and organisations to know how to respond if, if incidents happen, to know what to do if a child comes to them, that's a really important reform that we've got in the new child safe standards that should equip uh, volunteers to feel a lot more comfortable dealing with those situations. The new Child Safe Standard 9 um, highlights risk management as an important preventative measure to protect children and young people from abuse and neglect. So identifying and managing risk in organisations is a fundamental step to keeping children safe from harm. By adopting a risk management approach, uh, an organisation can actively reduce the likelihood of children suffering harm or abuse. All organisations must analyse and understand the potential risks to children they engage with. It's important to think about risks created by the organisational uh, structure, its culture, its activities and the physical and online environments of the organisation. Uh, it's really important as well that this is not just a once-off activity. You need to also identify and manage new risks as they arise. And this could be if you start a, a new activity within the organisation or uh, uh, you perhaps got a new facility that you're operating for children and young people. It's really important that you go through that risk identification and management exercise as well. New Child Safe Standard 10 sets out specific requirements for organisations to continuously improve implementation of the Child Safe Standard. So this is that requirement now to conduct regular reviews. Uh, you also need to analyse uh, complaints and incidents that have occurred in the organisation to ensure that organisational policies and procedures are being implemented by staff and volunteers and that they best meet the needs of children, young people and their families. Organisations now have an obligation to report uh, on these reviews uh, to staff, volunteers, community and families, uh, as well as children and young people. Finally, the new Child Safe Standard 11 recognises the need for organisations to have clearly documented policies and procedures to ensure that everyone from children and young people to staff and volunteers are aware of how the organisation intends to create a child safe environment. Documenting policies and procedures to implement all of the standards sends a message to everyone involved in the organisation that child safety is important. Policies and procedures will guide people within your organisation by describing how the organisation promotes wellbeing and prevents and responds to child safety issues. Organisations should give children, families and communities a say in the development of policies and procedures. Uh, leaders must champion and model the importance of child safety and wellbeing. Staff and volunteers should be provided with the information and support necessary to be able to put policies and procedures into practice. On their own, each uh, child safe standard might address a specific issue relating to child safety within an organisation, but to truly create a child safe organisation, it's important to take on a holistic approach where all of the standards work together and all of the standards are fully implemented. All right, as I said, whistle stop tour. Uh, we've, we've, we've only barely scratched the surface of what these are. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully that gives you a bit of a bit of an understanding, but also um, a bit of comfort that some of this stuff is very familiar and it's work that your organisation will already have done. So I stress as we go through the next part, which is talking to you about, um, I guess, some of the guidance on offer, um, uh, have a think about what are the new things that you need to do uh, and what are the opportunities for reflection about what you've already done um, so that you can uh, implement that review and improvement cycle that we're talking about. So 
the Commission's issued a new copy of our Guide to Creating a Child Safe Organisation and some other guidance as well. Um, our first version of this guide was issued in 2006, I think it was, so before, before the Child Safe Standards were law. Um, so year upon year, we've been gradually accumulating, I guess, a knowledge of what helps to keep children and young people safe in organisations. And so what you're seeing in this latest version uh, is uh, an even more in-depth expression of the things that we've learned as, a, uh, as an organisation over time that we're sharing with you and some really practical things in there, hopefully, that's going to help you get started with this work that you need to do. So you'll see in the guide that each of the, the each of the standards is expressed as a statement of an expected outcome. So those expected outcomes that I've just shown you as we went through the standards, uh, uh, and we've, we've got an example there um, on screen. Um, actually, I'll read out standard three again, that's probably a bit easier. So standard three requires that children and young people are empowered about their rights, participate in decisions affecting them and are taken seriously. So that's, that's an outcome that you're seeking to achieve uh, through your implementation of the standards. Uh, and so uh, what we ask you to do is uh, also look at what's now uh, new in the standards, which is these minimum requirements. So for each outcome, each high level statement for a standard, there are listed here some minimum requirements. Uh, those minimum requirements provide much greater clarity for organisations on the actions they need to do to meet each of the standards. Uh, this means there uh, can be little doubt as to what organisations need to do. Um, and uh, it's not a, I guess it's not a, a list to choose from, those minimum requirements. That's the full list of everything that you need to do. So if you think about it in that way. We've also provided um, uh, for each of the standards. So you've got the standard, you've got the minimum requirements. Those are the specific things that you must do. We've also then got for you uh, what we call compliance indicators. Uh, these are a list of documents and actions uh, which uh, the commission suggests are needed for you to implement the standards. So, uh, what we say is that organisations will generally comply with the standards if they produce uh, the listed documents and take the listed actions um, that are under the compliance indicators section. Uh, we've provided those compliance indicators based on, a, on, on feedback that we've received and reviews which have suggested that organisations want greater clarity from uh, regulators about what regulators look for when they're assessing compliance. So that's why we've, why we've popped that in there. The nature and characteristics of each organisation mean that uh, some will need to do something different. So, so those, those uh, actions and documents in compliance indicators are general in nature because we're trying to speak to the full 60,000 uh, organisations across Victoria that need to comply with the child safe standards. But some of you are going to have to think about it a little bit differently because of your own individual circumstances. Um, if that's the case for you, um, you'll just need to anticipate that if, if, if you're talking to the Commission, uh, you might need to explain how you're still meeting those minimum requirements and how you're still meeting that uh, outcome set out in the standard if you, if you deviate from the compliance indicators. Within our guidance material, we then have um, a lot of detailed information, uh, advice, tips, uh, tools, all sorts of things to help you then achieve those uh, minimum requirements. Um, and there's also in our guidance material often explanation as well about how um, meeting this particular standard um, uh, creates child safety, how it actually works to prevent child abuse, just to further that knowledge and understanding within your organisation. So I'm going to take you through uh, one of the standards in practice, just to sort of show you a little bit in detail how this works. Um, so what you can see here um, is a set of these documents. So this is this is Child Safe Standard Four, um, and what we've got here is uh, the documents to support you to comply with Child Safe Standard Four. So here we're saying. Uh, uh, what you need to do is have um, policies that reflect the importance of family and community uh, and 
sorry, let me start that again. The organisation's policies reflect the importance of family and community uh, involvement and describe the ways this involvement can occur. So we're not saying you need a standalone policy, we're saying your policies need to describe that. Um, we also have uh, one there that says complaint handling policies include procedures for keeping families informed uh, and provide guidance on how to do this while complying with obligations regarding confidentiality and privacy. So there we're talking about one of the particular policies that we say you should have, and we're saying, well, you need to make sure you're reflecting out families and communities within that policy. Uh, what we do also in the guide is we try and show you where the cross links are between standards, because um, there is some, uh, I wouldn't call it overlap, but I would say uh, when you're thinking about some of the concepts, they might be reflected across multiple standards. So we do try and connect you with some of that interlinkage as well. Here you can see some of the actions that we say you need to do uh, in order to comply with standard four. Uh, so for example, we're saying uh, that the organisation needs to support families and communities to take an active role uh, in promoting and maintaining child safety and wellbeing by communicating about their role in child safety and wellbeing within the organisation. And then we go on to talk around a range of other actions. So when you're looking at these documents and these actions that we are suggesting that you undertake, we're asking you to do all of them. Now, part of the reason for that, and, and you'll have a look at the guidance, you'll see we've got little numbers next to all of them. That's us saying which of the minimum requirements we're saying you're covering off by, by implementing those compliance indicators. So you'll be able to look through all of that. And as I said, think about the individual nature of your organisation and, and whether that's right for you. Now, I said I'd come back to Child Safe Standard 1 and just talk about um, the way that this is structured because it is slightly different. Um, standard 1 places new obligations on organisations to establish a culturally safe environment in which the diverse and unique identities and experiences of Aboriginal children and young people are respected and valued. So that's a very new statement of what organisations need to do. Establishing a culturally safe environment takes time, dedication and meaningful engagement. And so what we're saying here is that organisations need to commit long term and they need to be taking meaningful action each year to keep progressing their compliance with standard one. And so organisations realistically are going to be at very different stages in achieving compliance with this new standard. So taking this into account, we've developed two phases of compliance indicators to try and cater for those different, different kinds of organisations out there. We provide foundation steps, uh, which provide really a starting point for organisations who are yet to take uh, significant uh, steps towards creating a culturally safe environment for Aboriginal children and young people. Uh, foundation steps help uh, organisations to identify the work they have ahead of them and to build a plan of action. For organisations that have already taken some of those foundation steps or who already feel that they are significantly progressed in creating uh, a culturally safe environment, um, the guide also provides further steps to standard one. So these further steps support organisations to build on the work that they've already done and continue that journey towards uh, becoming a culturally safe organisation. The way the commission will approach this is that we'll first look for compliance with the foundation steps, um, uh, but then obviously uh, as time progresses, we'll certainly be looking for uh, full compliance with standard one with those further steps. Okay. So I mentioned the resources. There's lots of resources now, um, but there's gonna be different ways you wanna engage with this. So I'll just sort of illustrate a couple, couple of different ways to approach it. Uh, we've got a, a short guide to the child safe standards, which is just pictured on the right there. Um, probably the thing to understand about that is it's truncated, it's small, 
um, it's really a list of uh, the standards, the minimum requirements, the compliance indicators, and a very short description of some of the key concepts that you need to understand about that particular standard. Um, that document can be a good first um, entree into the child safe standards. Uh, it can be really helpful, for example, if you're sitting down and having a discussion with your team about what you need to do. Uh, and it's going to be a really useful document, I think, to help you start to start to get your implementation list together because you've got all of those compliance indicators in there in the one document. Then uh, the guide for creating a, new, uh, a child safe organisation is a much more detailed document and really in that one you've got uh, very detailed explanations, you've got tips, you've got tools, uh, you've got links to other uh, helpful resources. All right, I'm just checking. I got muted there for a moment. Am I back? Good, thank you. Um, so yes, the, the big guide, um, we suggest you, you kind of delve into then standard by standard. So let's say you, you're looking at standard four, we just went through before some of the actions and indicators that you need to, to look at, uh, some of the uh, actions and documents. So you then might say, I've got a few more questions there about how do I actually uh, involve uh, families in critical decisions in relation to children and young people? How am I going to get them to give me some, uh, uh, some input into my development of my child safe systems? And so the big guide will give you some tips about how you can bring together that sort of involvement. I just want to mention for a moment um, that we might have uh, some on the on the line who've also got um, other regulators for the child safe standards. So the commission is not the only regulator for the child safe standards. So we know that uh, there are certain organisations who, for example, might have, uh, let's say it's a school, uh, the, the, the VRQA, the Victorian Registration and Qualifications Authority um, is a child safe standards regulator uh, for schools and, and a range of other sectors that are up there. Uh, Department of Education and Training, a, a section there called, uh, uh, which, which has got the acronym QUAD, looks after so the you know, early years, early childhood providers. Uh, so they are a regulator for the standards. Uh, the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing also regulates uh, out of home care and a range of other organisations as well. So there are a few other uh, child safe standards regulators that I haven't mentioned there. Um, but just, a, I guess, a bit of a reminder of if your organisation's got another regulator for the child safe standards as well, just check in with them about their guidance material. Um, and if there's um, something different about their guidance material and that applies to your sector, your organisation, then we recommend that you follow that other regulator's guidance because the Commission's guidance is very general in nature. So uh, where to start? As I said, um, jumping into the short guide is props perhaps the first uh, place to go with this. Um, that'll give you that real overview, give you a bit of a sense of what are the different actions I need to take, what are the different documents I need to prepare. Uh, we suggest that you do a bit of a review of your existing policies and processes so that you can start to identify what are the gaps. Um, uh, and we're, we're just about in the next uh, few weeks going to uh, is reissue our self-assessment to tool that'll help you compare your current operations against the new standards and that, that'll, that'll help out with that as well. You might also want to look at that document I mentioned before that talks about what's new, so comparing the old standards with the new standards. And then when you want to dive into a uh, detailed understanding of an individual standard, that's when you grab the guide for creating a child safe organisation, go in there, go in depth, uh, expand your, your learning and your understanding of issues. Uh, we've got a range of templates up on our website uh, now to help you. So we've got a, a template there to help you create your child safety and wellbeing policy, one that's going to help you prepare your code of conduct. And there's a few others there as well. We'll keep building um, as time goes on. So, so I'm sure we'll be putting out all sorts of videos, uh, tools and, and things for, for a while to come. And, and when we release new resources, uh, we uh, send out a, an email to a subscriber list that we've got and um, we can share with you afterwards how to join up uh, for those updates if you, if you want to put yourself on the list for those. So I think that brings us to question time which is good. We've got some time, haven't we, Sarah? Fantastic. And look, thank you, Emily. That was a really comprehensive overview. And um, for a lot of our organisations, it is really tough to know exactly where to start. So I think you've 
provided some really good, uh, you know, just hints and trips about where people can get started with the resources. Um, and for a lot of people, the complication does come from their, you know, smaller organisations. They're figuring out how to involve volunteers who might have different lengths of engagement uh, with uh, groups. So it's, it's really helpful for you to provide such a comprehensive overview. We do have a few questions in the chat already. So I might just uh, uh, throw them at you um, and please encourage anyone else who has any questions uh, to pop them in the chat uh, as we're going. Um, so first of all, we did just have one question specifically regarding standard four. If your organisation deals with schools and students, not directly with families, what would that look like in terms of promoting to family and community? And I think that is actually a really important um, question to unpack because a lot of the organisations that we work with will sometimes work in partnership. Um, so uh, how does it look when you might be working with a school as a volunteer involving organisation, um, but don't have that direct portal to families and, and the wider community? That's great. Thanks, Sarah. And, and thanks for asking the question. Um, so look, I think um, the key word there, partnership, is probably something to explore a bit further. So in the same way that you've got a partnership with an organisation that brings the children and young people into your organisation, you, you probably need to expand that partnership then with the organisation to be able to um, uh, look at how you uh, involve families uh, as well. So if we go back to why we're we doing this, we're doing this so that we're better preventing child abuse. And so that obligation to prevent child abuse and, and the protective role that families play is there regardless of what the nature is of your involvement with families. So if we're putting children first, the importance of doing that is there still. Um, and you might just need to think about it slightly differently to some other organisation. So you could, for example, go to that partner organisation, say, hey, I need to survey families. Um, I really want their input into this, this thing that we're doing. Students come here a lot. Um, you know, would you be able to distribute this survey for me? Um, uh, you might offer um, uh, once-off sessions, for example, let's say you're trying to review your child safety policies and procedures. Uh, you, you could try and, uh, uh, you know, uh, be able to send a message out and say, you know, we'd, we'd love some people to come and uh, contribute to our review. Um, so there's all sorts of ways for you to think about it and you might need to work with others. I think, um, Sometimes other, other organisations can also actually help you generate parental interest as well. Um, uh, that is one of the things I think we flagged in our organisation that uh, it can take a couple of times to, to work out what that engagement looks like in a way that's um, attractive to, to families as well. Everyone's busy, they're doing things, you know, why would they want to contribute to what you're doing? Um, and, you know, sometimes it can take a little while to get that message right and also get the method of engagement right so that you're going to attract those people to to uh to participate fantastic emily uh and uh you know hopefully that's that's helpful for a number of people who are online working in partnership with other organizations uh to deliver projects across uh, a range of sectors that involve volunteers you know that is one of the complexities of our membership organization that people organisations that, uh, you know, we work across a number of sectors. Now, there was one other specific question around working across different states. Um, so um, someone who is working on projects that involve children across Victoria, WA, South Australia, and New South Wales, um, for the manager that oversees that project and may need to visit them interstate just as a base level requirement when we're talking with about screening, that person wanted to check that they need to have a working with children's check for each state. All right. Now, I'm, I'm going to start by saying I'm afraid I can't give you detailed advice about um, uh, working with children at check requirements. Um, I would actually suggest that you give, uh, in terms of the Victorian legal requirements, working with children check Victoria might be a good place to, to start. Um, and uh, we might see if we can give you the, the contact details for them if you don't have them. 
What I can say, though, is, is a couple of things. One is, um, for those of you who are working across jurisdictions, we know that you're going to have multiple sets of laws that you have to have to comply with. So uh, if you're working in New South Wales, New South Wales have also got mandatory child safety, uh, child safe standards as well. Their regulator has just started the Office of uh, Children's Guardian, New South Wales Office of Children's Guardians just started in recent months to uh, have the laws to back that in. Uh, and other states and territories are also thinking about it. I know if you're uh, getting any federal funding, there likely trying to um, uh, make sure that you're complying with the national uh, uh, principle for child safe organisations as well. So there's a big space there, lots of different laws for you to keep track of. Um, if you take it back to first principles though, if we're talking about screening, um, uh, from a child safe standards perspective, what you need to do is you need to be looking at each individual role understanding uh, what the risk is to children and young people of that individual role, and then thinking about what's the screening I need to take to best protect children and young people. Now, for that individual role, um, if you look at the Worker Screening Act, which is the Victorian legislation, um, some of those roles must have a working with children check. Then you need to think about your risk management. Even if they don't legally speaking under the Worker Screening Act have to have a working with children check. Do you want to ask for one anyway? Because you can. That is absolutely your discretion as an organisation. If you want to say you need a working with children check for that role, you can do that. Um, sometimes that's going to be a really useful and important part of your risk management under child safe standards to ask for that check, even though under the Worker Screening Act, you don't have to ask for it. And if that role has uh, engagement with children and young people, or if it has access to information about vulnerable children and young people, uh, uh, you may not have a um, uh, uh, good way to manage that risk without asking for a working with children check. So, so you've got to ask yourself those really practical questions as well. Um, in terms of other states and territories requirements, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm actually not on top of all of those, but I reckon there'll be uh, an equivalent working with children check type body in those states and territories who can help. But I just want to acknowledge it is for those operating across jurisdictions, there's absolutely a tapestry of laws, isn't there? And so I guess in changing to the new standards, one thing the, Vic the, the Victorian government is trying to do is trying to harmonise a bit so that we're hopefully all having the same base level standards, albeit we've got a couple of small differences. Hopefully that'll make it a little, little more straightforward. Um, if you're sitting there going, uh, goodness me, I, I am, uh, you know, New South Wales is telling me this, Queensland's telling me that, Victoria's telling me this, and they don't seem to be consistent. You're more than welcome to come to us and say, look, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to work out here which one I follow. Um, uh, can, you, can you help me? Uh, make sure that I'm compliant with Victorian law. Because at the end of the day, you must comply with the Victorian child safe standards. It's mandatory. You don't, you don't, you can't choose which bit you comply with, but uh, we're practical people. We don't want you to uh, go down a path which which sees you feeling like you're, you're having to implement two conflicting things. That's that's not in the interests of children. So so come and talk to us if you feel like you're in that position where the laws are conflicting. Thanks, Emily. That's great. Really consistent with the inform and educate approach of the yes. next uh, little while. Um, there was also another question around um, the suggested template for the code of conduct yep. um, and whether it relates to an additional standalone code of conduct or just adding to the existing code of conduct for volunteers. Because, you know, many organisations will have a separate standalone co code of conduct already for volunteers in their programs. Um, yeah. No, good one. And look, um, we're not prescriptive. So you could have a separate one, you could incorporate it into your existing volunteer code. The point being, though, is it has to be fit for purpose. So if your volunteer code doesn't set out um, behaviours that are appropriate and inappropriate with children in terms of preventing child abuse and doesn't give the necessary specific guidance about how your volunteers need to behave, um, if it's got really high level statements of, um, uh, you know, that are more about ideals and missions and values and doesn't give that really practical guidance about do this, don't do that, then it's not fit for purpose. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm a public servant. There's, there's the, the, the public servant's code of conduct. Um, that document is really high level. That doesn't deal with um, how I need to behave as a public servant with children. So we at the Commission have a separate code of conduct. Um, recognising that this needs to be something that's quite specific and quite clear. Um, it also helps, 
it helps volunteers know what they need to do. That's the other, other reason why you want this to be a really clear document. It's going to help them feel more confident that they're, they're doing the right thing. So don't, don't just think about it as a negative, don't do this. Think about it, how to make them feel comfortable engaging with children, young people, because uh, at the end of the day, we want all, all of the wonderful things that volunteers do for children and young people. We actually want to keep that going. Uh, so help them know how to do that in a safe way. And certainly from our perspective at Volunteering Victoria, we want organisations to feel confident engaging with younger volunteers. And so that's one of the reasons we're so pleased uh, to have you guys here to provide specific guidance. So, um, you know, implementing the child safe standards doesn't become, uh, you know, a reason for people not to accept volunteers younger than the age of 18, because um, that's certainly something that we'd encourage here at BB. We want people to start volunteering as early as possible. Um, uh, does anyone else have any more questions? Please pop it in the chat. Um, we really, we've got five more minutes, so I'd urge you to take advantage of Emily's uh, fantastic expertise. Um, but also feel free, Volunteering Victoria will be sending around uh, with a link to the presentation, but also um, a feedback survey for you to give us some feedback on today's session um, and an opportunity to pass on any questions that you might have after the fact to Emily and the team of the Commission uh, for Children and Young People. So um, I guess last call for questions, um, but you will be able to provide that, that feedback um, after the fact that should should go out in the next day or so. Just the other thing I'll mention whilst, whilst people, people are having a think about any more questions is um, we just did a, uh, uh, what we call our community of practice, which, you know, pre-COVID days was we actually brought people together. We had hundreds of people come together in a room to share practice and understanding about child safe standards. In the kind of COVID era, we've we've um, gone online and we've been doing webinars uh, and we've recorded quite a few of those now uh, as well. So they're up on our website. They, they can go for a sort of an hour, an hour and a half on particular topics. Uh, we've got a really good one up there um, uh, uh, around um, uh, culture change within organisations to promote child safety, for example. Uh, the one we did last week was around um, the new guidance material, pretty much is what I've taken you through today. So, so that one you may not need to watch as much, uh, but we did do another one earlier on what are the changes with the old standards to the new standards. So that might be of interest to you as well. So we'll keep adding to those videos as well um, uh, so that you've, you've got a bit more in-depth uh, uh, information there. So we've had a, a request to pop up uh, in where our subscriber list uh, is so that you can sign up. Um, if uh, Georgette can't immediately find it, we will email that to Sarah so that she can perhaps send that out. Um, but it's available on our website. Absolutely. All right, so we've... There's one final question that's yes. in there, which I think is actually a perfect place to leave it on. So uh, that's good. thank you to Elaine for highlighting that. Being a small sports club, um, how do we keep it simple? Um, and I think that's that's crucial because a lot of the organisations that we, some of which may be on board today, uh, some of which may be just logging on or um, accessing information after the fact, um, so many people are volunteers themselves and, you know, giving time, how can this become, I guess, as simple as possible for organisations to make sure they know they're meeting the minimum requirements? All right, um, step one, Big Sport has got all sorts of really good resources for sporting clubs that are tailored for, for you. So um, what I would suggest is uh, absolutely use the commission's guidance, but but go, go check out Big Sport because they've done a little bit, little bit of that thinking for you. Uh, the other thing I would say is um, uh, if, you, if you kind of go to the compliance indicators um, uh, and start with that, and what you want to be able to do then is say, okay, th this is my to-do list. Literally, that is your to-do list. You, you do all those things, you'll be okay. Um, don't think of them as um, uh, lots of individual actions. You can probably squish a lot of it together. So, for example, you need to have a child safety and wellbeing policy, and that should put all of your all of your kind of high level stuff in there. And we've got a, you know, a template there that helps you kind of step through that. Um, so what you're trying to do is uh, uh, go through those lists tick off those things. Um, uh, culture is something that gets built over time. 
uh, and that's the other piece that we certainly understand at the Commission. So uh, you're not going to magically uh, flick a switch and from the 1st of July 2022 uh, have all of the cultural components that are in there. Um, you need every person in the organisation to contribute to that culture and that takes time. So if we think about standard one, for example, that's around uh, uh, tackling racism. Now, uh, Grab off what, what you can do that year. That's what I would say on things like that. Have a really clear understanding of where you're driving on that child safe standard one, um, but just be really diligent to pick off year upon year upon year. Um, uh, and building your, um, uh, building your supporters within the organisation is important too. So we know that in lots of small organisations, it's the child safety person or it's the, you know, insert volunteer here who gets... Uh, uh, asked to, to, to implement the standards or implement things like that. And it's just something you can't do alone. You're going to need some critical allies in that to, to help bring the organisation along with you. So um, don't just think of it as a to-do list. Think about it as a broader um, uh, way for the organisation to be and think about who are your allies that you need to bring into that so it doesn't feel like it's just you and that, and that it's daunting. Um, the other thing I'd say is make it practical. This is all about being practical because at the end of the day, safety happens when people can take the actions. They're really clear. Oh, this is what I need to do. This is how I need to behave. Um, these are how I can make a child feel safe. Uh, when it's practical, it'll be helpful. Um, if it's a policy that gets written, that gets sat on a shelf over there, that doesn't help anybody. So, so try and think about it from a practical perspective and a way that meaningfully helps children and young people. Thank you, Emily. That's such a good place to leave it. And um, look, thank you for sharing your wisdom and your guidance. Obviously, we'll have some follow-up emails and, and thanks to uh, Georgette and David who popped that link uh, for sign up. Um, I'm sure uh, connecting closer with the Commission uh, is going to be the first thing on many people's to-do list uh, after they leave this webinar. So thank you all for your time this afternoon and um, best of luck with the journey ahead implementing the child safe standards the new ones Bye. that's great thanks sarah thanks everyone bye